A developing story with Boeing Starliner. As we saw, it goes smoke and fire on June the 5th, and it could be quite some time until those two astronauts return home to Earth. I want to put up this tweet right now from the New York Post saying the astronauts who went to the ISS, the International Space Station, for eight days could be stranded in space until 2025 because of problems with the Boeing ship. So this is a big development in terms of this. The two astronauts, they've already been stuck in space for more than 60 days, may have to wait until next year. NASA acknowledged that the astronauts who arrived on the maiden voyage of the Boeing Starliner spacecraft may have to be rescued by the rival SpaceX Crew Dragon though the vessel won't be ready until February. So a lot to get into in terms of the timeline, but an extended stay at the International Space Station for these two very experienced astronauts. Let's listen into a conversation I had a little bit earlier with Jonathan Siri about this exact topic. Let's listen in. Welcome back in here to Live Now from Fox. I'm Andy Mack. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a journey that was supposed to last Eight days, it could turn into about eight months as Boeing a Starliner, some new announcements from NASA that it could be pushed back the return date until 2025. We're gonna be joined right now by a Fox News correspondent, Jonathan Seri. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us here on Live Now from Fox. Some big developments with NASA. What did we learn and how soon could Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams return to Earth? Yeah, so there's a time span. If they keep them on the Boeing Starliner, it could be a matter of weeks, even days. But if they have to use a different spacecraft, we could be looking as late as February of 2025. The problem, Andy, is that there's not a lot of consensus right now. Uh, NASA engineers have been uh, discussing and debating the pros and cons of having uh, Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams return on the Boeing Starliner spacecraft, which had developed some thruster problems and helium leaks, uh, leaks during the inbound flight to the International uh, Space Station. Some of the engineers feel confident that these issues have been resolved and that there are at least workarounds that could bring them back to Earth safely, while other engineers just aren't comfortable making the call. They're saying, it, why risk this? We need to put them on a different spacecraft, have Boeing Starliner return autonomously, see how it does without the astronauts uh, having their lives risked on board and then placing the astronauts on another spacecraft. Most likely it would be a SpaceX Crew Dragon and although NASA is yet to improve any scenario, any uh, contingency plan, the one that I heard most discussed in this news conference is that Butch and Sonny would be incorporated into the Crew 9 mission. This was a, a NASA SpaceX joint mission a commercial crew mission that was supposed to launch on August 18th. Uh, they announced yesterday that they were pushing this to late September, September 24th, to give them more time to deal with the um, with the uh, Boeing Starliner issue. Well, under this plan, if they were to incorporate them into Crew 9, instead of the four astronauts who have been selected to launch on Crew 9, that would be reduced to two astronauts, two astronauts and two empty seats launching in late September. The two astronauts would reach the International Space Station. They would join Butch and Sonny, who would officially become part of Crew 9, participate in all of the experiments going on over the next five months or so, five to six months. And then sometime in February, all four astronauts would return on board that SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. So a wide range. We're talking about either days or perhaps as many as six months before Butch and Sonny return home. Yeah, a little bit of a traffic jam there at the International Space Station on the way and a lot to be decided as, like you said, people within NASA not at a consensus right now and they may have to decide by mid-August maybe what goes into that decision and would we get any clarity on maybe which way they're leaning? Yeah, well, they perform tests both on the ground and in space on the thrusters, and they're trying to emulate the problems that the astronauts encountered on the way to the International Space Station. What they believe, the leading theory, is that it has something to do with heat. 
affecting the seal, causing the seal to expand while it heats up and then contract when it cools down. The expansion blocks the flow of fuel uh, to those, those thrusters. And the thrusters in question are used for just very fine maneuvers, essentially attitude, the angle of the spacecraft while it's in, in space. And this is important when it's maneuvering uh, both to dock with the International Space Station and also when undocking. So you get that right angle, the correct angle before you jettison the, the service module, uh, which includes those, those thrusters. And then the capsule itself uh, goes into re-entry, protected by the heat shield, eventually slowing it down, releasing parachutes, and then hopefully landing a soft landing in the des desert, assisted by both parachutes and, and airbags. Um, and so when they did these hot fire tests with the spacecraft still docked with the International Space Station, the thrusters had had some time to cool down, and they just weren't encountering the same problems. They were uh, working in near ideal uh, conditions. And so that led some engineers to believe that, that it would be safe enough for the brief amount of time that the spacecraft would be free from the International Space Station and before you jettison the, the thrusters and the service module and the capsules on its, on its own re-entering the, the atmosphere. And then there are other engineers saying, until we can emulate this exact problem, either in space and on Earth, and know 100% what the cause is and what the solution is, it's not worth risking human life. And uh, one a NASA official said these discussions can be uncomfortable, but they're also good, that people ultimately feel confident enough to speak up for either position. Yeah, that is a very good point. And safety is the utmost importance for this crew right now. And Butch Wilmore, Sonny Williams have a ton of experience. So you can imagine maybe what's going through their head right now. I do have to ask you uh, my last question before I let you go here, Jonathan, as it was a historic launch back on June the 5th for Boeing to get Starliner there to the International Space Station. Do you think Boeing is losing any trust with NASA over what's going on with Starliner? NASA officials actually expressed optimism about the Boeing Starliner's future with the program. They said that ideally they would like to see the astronauts return on board Starliner so that they have a full set of data on what it's like to have a spacecraft with astronauts doing that entire mission from launch to landing. But they said that if the spacecraft has to return autonomously, that's not necessarily a disqualifier. Once they can get to the bottom of these thruster problems and helium leaks and solve them, they believe that Starliner actually has a very bright future with NASA, and they want to have this backup system because although right now the problem was with Starliner and they may have to wor wor rely on a, a SpaceX spacecraft to bring the astronauts home, they say in the future at some point the roles may be reversed and maybe it's a SpaceX problem and then they have Starliner as a backup. Yeah, and it's never bad to have too many paths to the International Space Station as well. That is always a good thing. All right, Jonathan, thank you so much. Great insight on a very big story we're following here on Live Now. My pleasure. All right, thank you again to Jonathan Seri for that report. The astronauts who went to the ISS for eight days could be stranded in space until the next calendar year because of problems with that spaceship. All right, right now, let's take you back out to some comments right now from NASA. They held a teleconference earlier on today talking about the resupply mission, but also talking about the timeline for Starliner as well as Crew-9. Let's listen in to some of these remarks here from earlier, courtesy of a, tele courtesy of a teleconference. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today. You know, as Ken noted, um, we take the accurate and timely sharing of information very seriously, and so I hope I can share with you the most up-to-date and relevant information on the ISS side uh, related to uh, onboard activities. Um, on board right now, we have six spacecraft um, attached to station with the arrival of Northrop Grumman 21 Cygnus mission recently. We have a number of spacecraft arrivals and departures that are upcoming in the next few weeks. We have a departure of the Progress 87P on August 12th. 
We've got the arrival of the next progress, which is 89P on August 17th. Uh, next arrival, the Soyuz 72S will be on September 11th. That'll be carrying NASA astronaut Don Pettit. And then after a handover period, the 71S Soyuz will depart on September 23rd with Tracy Dyson. Um, one of the things in the scenario that Steve laid out for you in terms of uh, vehicle sequencing, um, given that we have only two docking ports on board, and right now we've got Crew 8 vehicle on board and we've got Starliner on board, uh, before we launch Crew 9, uh, we will need to undock the Starliner first. So that's first in the uh, sequence of events. So after Starliner undocks, we'll launch Crew 9, and as Steve said, that's now moved to late September. Of course, the crew will do a handover, and then Crew 8 would leave about a week later. And around the corner after that, we will launch our SpaceX 31 Dragon cargo resupply mission. Um, I know in previous briefings I've mentioned that it's been uh, helpful to have the extra set of hands on board with Butch and Sonny. Uh, they've been continuing to help us out quite a bit with uh, maintenance and getting extra science done on board, which we really appreciate. I do want to highlight a, a few other um, special topic, a few other things for you. Um, for Northrop Grumman, uh, for that mission, that carried over 8,200 pounds of critical resupply, spares, um, crew supplies, and science. So the crew right now is spending their time um, unloading it. It's pretty busy the, the first couple days that a vehicle comes up. There's a lot of critical science and research and a lot of things that they uh, need to get to in the few, first few days, so that's what they're focused on. I do want to commend our Northrop Grumman and our NASA teams for the work they did addressing an engine burn execution issue that was encountered uphill. Shortly after launch, the, the spacecraft, the Cygnus' onboard limit detection system flagged an out of limit calculated parameter, so it takes a number of different inputs, it does a calculation, and that uh, violated a limit, and it, it did what it was designed to do, and it canceled the burn. The Northrop team took a close look at all of the individual engine parameters and determined that all of the hardware was actually functioning within acceptable limits, that calculation is a little bit more conservative. And so they reworked the uh, Farfield Rendezvous plan to keep us um, on time with our planned arrival time. It was pretty impressive to watch them do that. And of course, that was important to us because there's a lot of science and research that, that has uh, limited uh, time frames that it can handle between launch and arrival. So they did a fantastic job uh, recovering and reworking the, the plan after that uh, burn issue they had. Um, yesterday's capture of NG-21 was actually the 50th free flyer capture that we've done on board station. Uh, of course, we used the SSRMS or Canada Arm 2 to do that. That's pretty impressive. The first one was about 15 years ago. It was HTV-1. That was on September 17, 2009. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of tickled by that data point because I was the lead flight director for HTV-1, and I remember sitting on console that day, first time we'd ever tried to capture a free-flying vehicle with a, a robotic arm, and pretty impressive now to think that we've now done 50 of those. Um, and then, as, as I mentioned, Progress 89P is coming up, and of course that is loaded with a lot of food, propellant, and supplies uh, for the Expedition 71 crew. I want to give a little bit more detail to what Steve talked about with the, with the task orders. Um, and, and we understand there's been a lot of confusion. We do a lot of work off and on with SpaceX for any number of different scenarios and contingencies. Um, and so they're not specifically new activities for us, but just, just to give you a little more detail, the task order that was issued to SpaceX in mid-July was developed to support a contingency return capability for Tracy Dyson, similar to what we did with Frank Rubio. If you recall with Frank Rubio, after we had the Soyuz coolant loop leak, we put in place a capability that allowed for a five crew return with the Dragon. When we did that, um, we used the Soyuz seat liner as the cushion on the Dragon cargo pallet for Frank. And what we realized after that is ideally we wouldn't be taking the Soyuz seat liner and moving it, it is vulnerable to damage uh, when you, you pull it out and you move it around. 
And so we worked in a solution that uses a foam, just different foam basically for the cushioning and didn't require us to move the seat liner. So that gives us a lot more flexibility and doesn't put that Soyuz seat liner at risk. So that's the work that we had um, SpaceX do in mid-July, and that's actually the generic contingency configuration that we plan to use for all of our Soyuz crew members if we ever encountered a Soyuz vehicle issue and needed to, to use the Dragon. And then as Steve mentioned, we also increased that number to a seven just so that we have a, a full range of capabilities for future contingencies. Um, we are really fortunate that we've got evolving capabilities in a framework that allows us to put in place alternate crew contingency options. Um, I think the Soyuz coolant leak taught us quite a bit. You know, we're always, we'd always been protecting for anomalies on board station, but you know, you can have any number anom of an anomaly on a crew vehicle too, whether it's a micrometeoroid strike or anything else. So smart for us to always have backup, backup plans in place. Steve mentioned the specific backup plan for Starliner, and just to give you a, a few other pieces to that plan, uh, if we did uh, fly up Crew 9 with two crew, our plan is to leave Butch and Sonny on board to execute that, the rest of that expedition. They would return on Crew 9 with the, the normal crew rotation timing. Um, a couple years ago, we made the decision, knowing that this was a test flight, uh, to make sure that we had the right resources, supplies, and training for the crew just in case they needed to be on ISS for whatever reason for a longer period of time. So Butch and Sonny are fully trained. Um, they're capable and current with EVA, with robotics, with all the things we need them to do. Of course, as you know, they have both actually done expeditions on board station previously. They've also done EVAs for us. Um, I did pre-position their EVA year um, earlier in the year just to have that on board so they've got um, suits that that fit them and so um, no no issue or challenge with them performing the uh, the increment if we really had to do that and to reiterate what Steve said those are backup contingency plans we have not made any decisions um, at all in, in, in terms of, of uh, anchoring to a specific plan um, I hope that helps fill in some of the blanks and, and uh, keeps you guys fully informed with our latest. And with that, I will turn it back over to Leah. Are you just listening in there to different officials within NASA and Boeing talking about this? The latest as they will remain at the International Space Station for quite some time. They don't need to make a decision uh, for a few weeks and potentially it could uh, mean that they're up at the International Space Station until 2025. A big development that we're following very closely here on Live Now from Fox since that launch back in June. All right, a live picture right now out of Wisconsin.